Alrighty, you guys, time for the Tomes of Terror show once again. I know last week I kind of did a sort of killer kid kind of story, sort of, uh, confessions, which kind of had a killer kid aspect to it. However, this week we are going full on murderous child, and we are talking about the 2018 book Baby Teeth by Zoya Stage. Now, this was a book that, again, uh, you know, I saw tons and tons of reviews of this. It seems like the reviews of this, it's, they were very, like, polarizing. Like, people either really, really loved it, or they really, really did not like it um, for various reasons. You know, that's fine. Everyone has their opinions about it. Um, I actually loved this book. Um, I'm just going to say that right out front. And I didn't really get, I mean, I guess I kind of get why people wouldn't. But I didn't like some of the issues that people had with the book. I didn't really have issues with that. So your mileage may vary as usual, but let's kind of talk about this. And like I mentioned, like on a couple of my other reviews, I'm not going to like outright spoil, spoil anything. Like I'm not going to tell you how it ends or anything like that. But um, I am going to give like a plot synopsis and then I might want to go like a little more in depth into like what the book is about, like what it's saying. And to do that, I might have to spoil some things that you might prefer not to know about the book. So as usual, if you like to come at books with just no foreknowledge of what's going to happen in there or as little foreknowledge as possible, then probably you want to wait until after you read the book and then come back and watch this and then we can talk about it in the comments if you would like to. So now this is apparently, this is Zoya Stage's first novel. Um, I don't know if she's written anything subsequently, but this seems to be the one that everyone was uh, talking about. It came out in the summer of 2018. Now, what this is about is there is a family. Uh, they live in Pittsburgh. Now the dad's name is Alex, so the Jensen family. Uh, the dad's name is Alex. He's uh, originally from Sweden, but he's lived in the U.S. a very long time. And he is kind of like a hipster, like a hotshot architect. Like he's kind of like very up in the avant-garde and the green movement and everything like that. So he's, you know, that kind of like very modern dude or whatever. And he has a wife named Suzette who was, she's kind of an artist. And I think she also started out as an interior designer. And actually they used to work together for a time uh, until they had a kid um, at which point their their lives changed. We'll, we'll put it that way. Suzette also, uh, for most of her life, has suffered with Crohn's disease, uh, which you don't know if it's like an autoimmune disorder. It's, you know, uh, makes it very difficult to like digest certain foods. And sometimes you end up having to have like parts of your uh, small intestine, I believe, removed. Um, you know, it's, it's not a fun disease and it's uh, a lot of people are in a lot of pain all the time and it's very difficult for them to eat things. So she has that and she's dealing with that as well, as best as could be expected. Cause like she's been suffering from it, I believe, um, from her teenage years or something like that. So this couple are kind of like the, they're, they're actually quite, um, I don't, not wealthy, but they're probably upper middle class. Um, you know, they have a very nice house, which Alex kind of designed and, um, you know, and laid out and that Suzette kind of decorated. So they seem to have this idyllic life. They're very much in love with one another. Um, he is very supportive of her artistic ambitions. He is very supportive of her, like very helpful, you know, with her disease, like managing her disease and things like that. But then they have a kid. Now this kid is a little girl and her name's Hannah. They don't talk too much about what the kid was like when she was growing up. The book is actually the time that it's set in the modern day. Uh, the kid is seven years old. They do talk a little bit about like her being a baby and seemed pretty normal. But then when she was right around three years old, they started to, you know, they started to clue into the fact that maybe something wasn't right with Hannah. Now, one of the main first things that they noticed was that Hannah wouldn't talk. Either she wouldn't talk or she couldn't talk. They couldn't determine which of those it was. So they started to get worried because obviously she was three years old and she wasn't talking. And so it seemed like it was, you know, she wasn't meeting all the milestones. And they thought it was a little odd. So they basically started taking her to, you know, very specialists, seeing if there was something physically wrong with her, if there was some reason why she wasn't talking, if she had some kind of, 
you know, some kind of physical disorder. It seemed like they were mostly trying to focus on that. But as time went on, it became clearer that it wasn't just the fact that she was mute, that there also might be something else the matter with her. It comes to pass that she has been, uh, every time they sent her to a preschool or later on they tried to take her to other schools, she always ended up getting kicked out, uh, usually for violent outbursts against other students. So finally, they've kind of exhausted their educational possibilities like in the area and Suzette, the mom, has had to basically take on the entire task of homeschooling Hannah and taking care of her all the time, which means that she can't have any of her own ambitions anymore. She had to like give up her work. Um, Her Crohn's disease has been getting worse, like I said, because her medication is kind of messed up. And so she's kind of dealing with all that. And then she has to deal with this essentially demon child in her house. So that's kind of the plot synopsis. Like I said, I want to go a little bit more in depth into some shit that happens in this. So if you don't want to know any more than that, then, you know, check out now and then go read it and come back. Like I said, I'm not going to spoil anything outright, but I do want to kind of talk about some shit that happens in this book because this book is very disturbing. It's not supernatural. There's nothing supernatural in it. It's basically like I've seen it compared to we need to talk about Kevin Um, I've seen it compared to The Bad Seed, The uh, Good Son, The Good Son with Macaulay Culkin, like movie from the 90s, I think it was. So kind of like that. So anything where you have a kid who is just like a complete shit and is just a terrible, terrible person and how you go about dealing with that. Now, the way that the book is written is really interesting. It basically goes back and forth between Suzette's point of view, the mom's, and Hannah's point of view. Now, one criticism that I saw of this book, which I didn't really find, um, you know, I didn't find particularly egregious or it didn't bother me, was that the sections that are written from Hannah's point of view seem too mature for a seven-year-old. Maybe, but I didn't really get that. Hannah, it is established, is not only intensely disturbed, she is also very, very intelligent and very, very manipulative. And honestly, I thought Zoya Stage did a very good job of kind of finding that balance between kind of a childlike mentality. Like for example, one of the things that um, is kind of a running thread throughout the book is that Hannah believes that she is either channeling or that there's like the spirit of like an ancient, like a witch that was burned, like during like a French witch that was burned during the European witch trials is like inside her and is like helping her out, like helping her to figure out plots of like destructive shit she's going to do. So she really does believe that. And she believes wholeheartedly like in curses and, and that they work. You know what I mean? She's, she takes it very, very seriously. So she still has this very childlike, magical thinking kind of thing but then also she's like a really like machiavelli machiavellian like she's just this really manipulative horrible girl but she's not like a mastermind like she does things and they don't go the way she thinks they're going to go because her perception of how her mother and father see her is erroneous Um, But she doesn't realize that, you know what I mean? So I think that they, I think that the author did a really good job of like conveying that. So one thing too, that was really kind of had me on the edge of my seat during this. This was another book that I read very, very quickly. I probably read most of it in one sitting and then like finished it up the next day because it's it's a very easy read and it's very, very tense. It really kind of keeps you, it's not like, you know, super action packed or anything, but just like the fucked up, like psychological battle of wills, like between the mom and the daughter is just so, and it just keeps ramping up and ramping up. And the kid just keeps doing more and more like fucked up stuff. And it just kind of, and you're like, it made me like really nervous. Like when I was getting toward the end and I was just like, oh shit, man, like what's going to happen? This is going to be really, really bad. And it does kind of go in that direction. And another thing too, that made it, even more nerve wracking and more frustrating was that Alex, the husband, he seems like the way he's portrayed in the book, he's just like a very, he's a lovely man. He's, he's, you know, very nice. He's very supportive. Um, He's 
clearly loves his wife very much. He clearly loves his daughter very much. But one thing is that Hannah, the daughter, is smart enough to essentially play her mother and father off of each other. Because it seems like when you read the sections that are from Hannah's point of view, in her mind, she loves her dad more than anything else in the world. And she wants her dad like all to herself. So in her mind, like logically to her, she needs to get mommy out of the way by killing her, essentially. She also thinks wholeheartedly believes that mommy is also a witch who has cast a spell on daddy and is will make daddy not love her. Um, so she's constantly trying to like undermine and manipulate and she's playing them off one another. So Alex, the dad, whenever he's around, Hannah behaves like an angel. She is just like, can be, and she's super loving. She doesn't talk, but you know, she's always like playing with him. She's very happy. She's huggy and everything like that. So Alex never sees the demonic side of her. I'm using demonic, not in a, not in a literal sense. I'm using it in a figure, figurative sense. Cause this kid is just awful. This is an awful, awful child, but he never sees it. And even when he has other people's testimony of how shitty her behavior is, like Hannah hates her mom and she basically will only act out when she's either alone with Suzette or when she's at school. But the weird thing is, is that even though Hannah has been like kicked out of all of these schools and clearly has some issues, um, mainly the not talking, Alex kind of refuses to see it, which is frustrating, but also really realistic because that's kind of one thing I think some reviewers that I saw were like, oh, they didn't think this was all that realistic or the way that the little girl's essentially psychopathy, um, you know, sort of manifested itself was not all that realistic or the way that the parents reacted to it was not realistic. I did not find that to be the case. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have children. And after reading this, I'm glad I never had any. And if you're on the fence about having kids and you wanted to read this, you will not want them anymore. Trust me. <laughs> like after reading that, I'm just like, who dodged a bullet on that one? Cause I'm sure Man, if you had a kid like this, well, it would be horrifying. So the thing about it is that, you know, when it's your kid, nobody wants to believe that their beautiful, adorable little girl who is seven is a psychopath. You don't want to believe that. So I do feel like, I mean, yes, they first went like the physical realm. Maybe she has a brain tumor, maybe something, you know, something like that, which is what you would do because nobody wants, I mean, for better or for worse, I mean, for worse, obviously, mental issues still have a lot more stigma to them than, you know, physical disabilities, for example. So obviously parents who, even if they suspected that their child, you know, was a sociopath or a psychopath or had, you know, those, that type of uh, disorder, you would really try everything you could to not have it be that like to be something physical that could be fixed or something because you know once once somebody says to you hey your kid is a psychopath where do you go from there because they don't know you know not a lot is known about it it's like what can we do to fix this you can't it's not something easy that you can fix so i do see how in this book the parents would be really really reluctant to put that label on her or or to believe that that's really what was going on. Now that said, obviously Suzette, the mother, um, is a lot more clued in because not only, you know, she had to deal with all the schools and stuff that kicked this little brat out, but she's also with this kid pretty much all day, every day. Because like I said, she has to homeschool her because no other schools will take her. And this kid is just awful and she hates her mom. She wants her mom dead. She wants her mom out of the way. And she is constantly trying to find ways of doing that. Or at least, I mean, when it first starts out, she kind of is trying to find ways to make mommy ugly so that daddy doesn't love her anymore, like cutting off half of her hair. Um, and then she tries to like fuck with her medication, um, you know, thinking that will make her die or it will make her sick or make her ugly. Um, so she's trying to do that and then it just keeps like ramping up and up. So it's very, very frustrating that Alex, 
who is like a likable dude. He's not an asshole. He's not mean. He's not, you know, like, he clearly loves his family very much, but he's kind of clueless. I mean, he's at work all the time. He doesn't see Hannah behaving in any way other than, oh, you know, she's just special. She's different. She's very loving toward him. So then he comes home and, you know, Suzette saying, hey, she cut off half my hair or, hey, she put thumbtacks on the floor. Like, so I would step on them when I got out of bed. Like she does stuff like that. And so Alex is almost like, not really believing it or not believing it's as bad as Suzette is saying that it is. You know, even though he's getting input from the other schools that are like, hey, you know, she just barks like a dog or she like hit this other kid or, you know, it, it, very early in the story, Suzette is out with Hannah, like at a, you know, at a supermarket or something like that. And Hannah straight up just like punches this little baby, you know what I mean? Like in the head or whatever, like doesn't really, really hard him, but like just punches this baby. And it just seems, it's really frustrating that Suzette is like, hey, you know, your kid punched a baby. And then <laughs> the dude's just like, oh, I'm sure she didn't mean it or it was an accident. Or he's always trying to like come up with some excuse as to why Hannah acted like that. Or maybe Suzette's making a big deal out of nothing. So, so it's very frustrating, but you can see why, because like I said, he doesn't see it, so it's not going on. And really it takes almost, you know, at least the halfway point of the book before something happens that is so egregious that he can't deny it anymore. And then finally he has a come to Jesus moment where he's just like, oh my God, something is wrong with our kid. You know, she is putting my wife at risk. So finally he gets on the clue bus and they, you know, start to, try to work together to figure out what the hell is wrong with this kid or if something can be done about her. Another aspect I really, really liked about this book, and like I said, I'm not a parent, but you know, I've, I've known a lot of parents. I've been a lot of, around a lot of kids and stuff like that in my life. And I've heard other people like talk about their parenting experiences, particularly mothers, because I do feel like this is kind of sad and maybe it's getting better than it was, but I do feel like if something is wrong with your kid, the mom's going to get the blame somehow. You know what I mean? Especially like when you see like serial killers and stuff, like reading about serial killers and they're always like, oh, well, their mom was overbearing or their mom was this or that and the other. So what I, I do feel like there's an aspect of always kind of trying to blame the mom a little bit. So I like that that's addressed like to a very large degree in this, because as I said, half of the book is from Suzette's point of view. So you're getting like her thoughts, her feelings about this child. She clearly loves the kid, but not only does she have like a physical disease that she's dealing with that is chronic and that is very, you know, that affects her life like in a lot of negative ways, but she also had a very troubled relationship with her own mother. Um, some of that stemming from the Crohn's disease because when Suzette was growing up, she kept complaining about all the pain she was in and stuff and her mother never really took it seriously. And so Suzette was like a teenager before it finally got bad enough that she had to go to the hospital and they're like, hey, your intestines are all fucked up, like you need surgery. So she always kind of like resented her mother for not really wanting her or not really paying that much attention or not, you know, giving her the love that she thought she deserved. So now that Suzette has her own child, and there is clearly something very drastically wrong with this child, she can't help but think that, is there anything I could have done different? Have I, was I, did I act like my mother acted toward me toward her inadvertently? And that's what caused her to be this way. You know, is it something that I've, so she, you know, blames herself a lot and it's just really, and it's heartbreaking because I, I mean, as the book goes on, it kind of gets to a point where you think that, they don't really, it doesn't really definitively say like whether Hannah was just born evil, like if she's just like a horrible, horrible child, if she can be helped or if it was something that the mom did because there are a couple of things that happen in the book where like, for example, I'll probably, I'll give an example. Like she has built this little, she has this favorite book that she reads, um, Hannah does. Her daddy always reads it to her. And it's about this little, creature called an under slumber bumble beast. Yeah. So it's this little creature from what I could determine that is like made of like all these little spare parts and then it like comes to life. 
So her dad gives her like a potato and tells her, you can make your own. You know what I mean? So she makes it with all these pencils and stuff and like sticks it under her bed. But because Suzette didn't know about that and didn't know what the story was, she sees this thing like under her daughter's bed and she thinks that it's a voodoo doll because of the way that one of the eyes is drawn and then like one of this, like a teacher at this this one school that they try to put Hannah in, like he had something wrong with his eye. So she was almost like believing. She's like, holy shit, like maybe, maybe this is a voodoo doll and maybe this shit really works. Like that's kind of at the stage that she's at. Like she knows there's no possession. She knows there's nothing like that. But the fact that she entertained that possibility for a second just goes to show like how fucking over it over it she is like dealing with this dealing with this fucking demon spawn child that she has so i really like too that they added that aspect of suzette constantly questioning herself like maybe maybe something i did caused her to be this way maybe me reacting to her in a particular way is making her like this and for the first half of the book, she's very, very isolated because like I said, Alex, her husband doesn't ever see the daughter behaving in this particular manner because the kid is smart enough to like manipulate him and like, like I said, work them against each other. So it's almost like this weird sick competition like between the mom and the daughter without Suzette really fully grasping that it's a competition maybe. Like, I don't know if she necessarily sees it that way. Um, she does kind of, I think maybe she does harbor some resentment toward the kid for, you know, it used to be like when it was just her and her husband, um, you know, and they were working together and she got a lot more, you know, she did her artistic stuff and she was a lot happier, more, you know, now she's kind of like tied down at home all the time, like with this kid who, you know, clearly hates her. So there is some resentment there, but it's understandable resentment. So, but I really like the way that it kind of goes into the, like this thorny issue of, you know, the mom constantly questioning her decisions, constantly blaming herself. Am I making too big a deal about this? Is Alex right about it? Is, you know, should I try to be nicer? Should I try to communicate with her in a way that, you know, she would understand maybe I'm doing something wrong. So I really do like that, that, that they go a lot into that because it leaves it this kind of ambiguous you don't really know you know whether there is anything that could have been done differently that would have made this horrible child turn out any better you know what i mean so that said like i said now if you're really into evil kid stuff i mentioned before uh we need to talk about kevin which was actually about kind of an older kid i think it was like a psychopath he was a school shooter i believe the good son anything like that particularly the bad seed this reminded me a lot of that so if you really really like evil kid books you will probably really dig this this is not like i said it's not there's nothing supernatural about it. There's nothing. It's very, very grounded and very realistic, you know, to a degree. Although obviously it might be a little bit exaggerated because some of the shit that this little kid comes up with is just, um, I didn't really think it was that unbelievable that like a seven-year-old kid, like a really bright one would come up with some of this shit because she had like logic behind what she was doing. And to me, it seemed very much like seven-year-old kid logic. Other people's mileage may vary if you have a seven-year-old kid and it seemed like unrealistic to you. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm just saying from my point of view, having been around, you know, children that age a lot because my parents used to run a daycare, my mom ran a daycare to the house and then they ran like a, a regular daycare with like, you know, dozens and dozens of kids. Being around some kids, I would not put it past some seven-year-olds to totally, like, pull this kind of shit and, like, no. So, I'm just saying. I, did, I didn't find it unrealistic in the slightest. But some of the shit that she does is, like, really, really fucked up. And maybe if you have a kid, it this might kind of bother you. Like, because some of the shit that Suzette thinks about the kid. But... Coming from my point of view as an adult and imagining myself in those shoes of like having this child and you had all these, you know, hopes and dreams about how this little girl was going to turn out and she looks adorable and everything. And then she just turns out to be essentially a monster. How would you feel about that? It's a, you know what I mean? Would you contemplate, you know, even killing the kid, which she kind of does at some point, but she doesn't really go that far, but you can understand why somebody would think that because what the fuck else, like some of the shit that this kid does is just like super fucked up. And you just kind of, 
at some point you're going to have to like throw up your hands and be like, you know, I don't know what to do uh, with this child because it's just, you know what I mean? So it basically, I think it's marketed as a psychological thriller, which I guess it sort of is, but it definitely does shade into psychological horror. I mean, some of the shit that happens in this is like pretty messed up. Um, So it's kind of occupies the same space I guess, as confessions, which I was talking about last week, which is kind of not like overtly like gory horror or anything like that, but it's like really creepy, like psychological horror and kind of getting into the mind of a family, like a really dysfunctional family that seems like really perfect on the surface, but then kind of getting into the heads of the mom and the kid and this kind of like battle of wills between them. I kind of liked a lot of people. I I noticed like um, some of the reviews too. Like I said, this seemed like one that was either like five stars or one star. Like some people really seem to hate it. I Like I said, the, the main criticism I saw was, oh, it was unrealistic. Like a seven-year-old kid couldn't come up with some of that shit, which I disagree. But like I said, I don't, you know, I don't know. And a lot of people didn't like the ending because they thought it wasn't, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but they thought that it was too ambiguous or it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go, or they thought that it was going to be like a bigger splashy ending or something like that. But that really didn't bother me at all. I actually really liked how it ended. I like that it kind of, I don't know if I'd call it like open and open-ended end. It was kind of like that, but I kind of like that because like I said, it was more realistic because, you know, when you're approaching a a kind of a sensitive subject matter like this from that point of view, it's like, there's really only, unless you're introducing supernatural elements, which this doesn't have, you know, there's only a couple ways that it can go. And also when you're dealing with a kid that has this, you know, clearly very severe mental illness there there's really not a lot because it's such a nebulous you know topic you don't really know how it's gonna go you don't know i mean is this kid ever gonna be able to get better i mean is she gonna like grow up normal or is she just always gonna be this way is there anything we can do about it and so like i said there's you you don't know that so i like that the book kind of went with that idea so as i said if you're into evil kid stuff, cause I really like evil kid movies and evil kid books and stuff like that. And this kid is pretty fucking evil. Um, so, and like I said, if you, you need some like birth control or something like some, some cheap birth control, <laughs> this book will do it. It's like, seriously, if you if you're thought, well, maybe, maybe someday I'd like to have a kid. Yeah. Read this and you'd be like, okay, yeah, no, fuck that. But yeah, so it's definitely a really good book and I will be, uh, looking out for more stuff from, uh, Zoya stage as well. Cause this is, uh, pretty awesome, like for a first novel. And uh, that'll do it for Tomes of Terror this week. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.